Dr. Dale Sides. The stars in the heavens are in fact the Word of God. Christological astronomy. And astrology is all about me. But astronomy, and especially Christological astronomy, is all about thee. The heavens do not dictate your life. God dictates your life. Hey, welcome back. We are dealing with Christological astronomy. And in our last session, we covered some fundamental details about the celestial word, how to read it. And we're going to get into some more details of that as we go on a lap around the ecliptic, as I call it. Uh, but before we do, there's a couple of things I wanted to pick up that I didn't mention in the last session. First of all, <clears throat> I've been using this word, talking about this word astrology. And um, I want to give you a little bit of, of a word lesson here uh, on these words. There's basically three words that we're dealing with. Uh, in this subject that uh, I want to cover with you. First of all is the word astronomy. And astro is the prefix which is, means star. And the nomos of astronomy is the, the, the word, nomos is the word for law. So astronomy is the laws of the heavenly bodies. Okay? You know, and we've got different laws that govern our earth, right? We spin daily, we rotate yearly, and we precess every 26,000 years. That's the one that the astrologers forgot to factor in was the precessional move. But, but there's, there's astronomos. There's, there are laws of the stars, this astronomy. Now, next, next there's the word astrology. And Astrology is sort of like the word seer, if you remember this in the Bible. It says in the Bible that uh, the prophets used to be called seers until the false prophets took the name. And so then the prophets just were called prophets and not seers. And, and, and so they just left the word seer alone because it had a, a, a wrong connotation. Well, astrology is the same way. But astrology is astro, the stars, and logos, which is, I mean, ology, which is the study of like biology or physiology. Uh, but anyhow, the root word of ology is logos, which is the word. And so actually, the root word of astro the way that astrology should be handled, the root of it is the astrologos. Now, all of a sudden, that gives you whiplash because we realize that the Logos is Jesus Christ. He's the incarnate Word, right? Well, He's also the Astro-Logos. What a beautiful depiction of who Jesus Christ is. He's the Astro-Logos. And look, astrology in its simplistic terms is the study of the stars. There's nothing wrong with that word. The connotation that astrology has picked up uh, has become so perverse that we, I'm not even going to fight over the Word, but I'll tell you, I'm fighting over astrologos because that's Jesus. Amen? And the last word we hardly ever hear anything about is a word that is deeply submerged in astrology, that's, we, that's you know, the, the commonplace astrology, and that's the word... Um, um, Astromancy. And the, the mancy root of this is divination. And that's so they, this is the divination of the stars. And that's what we're really not into. Because divination is whenever you consult anything for divine that's not God. And so when astrologers consult the stars for messages without going through God, they're trying to steal God's secrets, and they're trying to explain the way we are without putting God in the picture. I'm sorry, but He's the one that created us. So understanding these things, I believe, will help you to understand astronomy, the laws of the stars, astrology, the word that's in the stars, right? Or the study of the stars, but astromancy is what we don't like and we confront, and that's what the Bible, when it talks about 
the astrologers, they were the astromanciers. They were the ones that were using the stars for divination. So anyway, those are some of the, the basics of, of these star names. And let me cover just a little bit more about astronomy. And then in this session, I want to take you through the ecliptic path. And then I want to begin teaching you on the birth of Christ, which is where we'll really get into a lot of the specifics of this. But the, um, the, this aspect of the Word of God in the heavens as far as astronomy goes, let me explain this to you real, real quickly. I said that the earth spins in a day, right? That's 24 hours. And it rotates or, or revolves around the, uh, around the sun in a 365 and a quarter uh, year package. But the earth also has a movement called a precessional movement. And what that really means is that it's got a backwards wobble. Like if you spin a top and the top is spinning real fast this way, but because it's oblong and out of round, it's got a backwards wobble like a gyroscope does. Well, the earth has got a gyroscopic movement as well, and it rewinds, but it, it doesn't just wobble backwards. It, it, it wobbles like this. I mean, it does the whole thing and with as far as rewinding and with the earth being offset on a 23.5 degree the earth's axis then when it wrote when it moves like this the whole orientation of the of the earth is moving relative to the sun so it the earth precesses one degree every 72 years so if you multiply 72 times 360 degrees, you've got how long it takes the earth to move through its precessional cycle. And that is what the hype about the year 2012, the winter solstice of 2012 is about, is because it does in effect actually complete what is called the great year. And this is another astronomy, astro, astronomos, another law of astronomy, and this, this, see, what happened was when the astrologers wrote the astrology tables, it was almost 2,300 years ago, uh, and it was in Egypt and Greece where they wrote the astrology tables. And since then, the earth has moved. If you divide 72 into 2,300, you find out it's moved a little over 30 degrees, which is an entire uh, measurement of a constellation in the ecliptic path. So doing the math on that, there's 12 of them. 12 into 360 would be 30 degrees each. This has moved an entire house, an entire constellation since these uh, astrology tables were written. Funny story about this. Um, I first started studying these things uh, about the movement of the heavens uh, many years ago, but I was introduced to a, an old timer. One of the one of the leading astrologers in the country until he got born again and then he quit his astrology uh, astromancy practices and um, but anyhow he's very knowledgeable of the heavens and uh, I asked him to teach me what he knew and so his name is Harry he's from South Carolina and uh, anyhow he's a super old super guy anyhow one night I'm out talking to Harry and Harry said to me well Dale when were you born you know, like, when was your birth date? And I thought, dun, 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 dun. You know, well, I'm not going to tell him my birth date because this will get into astrology. And I'm thinking, you know, well, hey, I mean, you know, this is in the, for the cause of understanding truth. So I said, okay, my birth date is 9949. I'm, I was born in September, you know, 9th, 1949. He says, oh, so you're a Virgo, a Virgoian. I said, oh, yeah, right, okay, so whatever you say. Anyway, he said, uh, well, that should really interest you because uh, right now Saturn is in Virgo. And so I'm standing outside uh, at the top of my driveway talking on the phone and, and understand I'm talking to a guy that's a virtuoso. But I said, I said, Harry, you're telling me that, that, that uh, Saturn is in Virgo? And I said, uh, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but it's not. He goes, well, yes, it is. And I said, well... Again, I don't want to be disrespectful because I understand, you know, I'm, cons I'm asking you to teach me stuff. I said, but it's not in Virgo. It's in Leo. He goes, well, no, Dale, it's in Virgo. I said, no, Harry, it's in Leo. He said, look, I'm reading the tables. I said, I'm reading the heavens. 
I'm looking at Saturn. I know what Leo looks like. It's not in Virgo. It's in Leo. Of course, you know, being the mild-mannered reporter from the Daily Planet that I am, you know. Uh, but he said, oh, he said, oh, you're looking at the heavens. I'm looking at the tables. I went, what kind of gobbledygook is this? Reading some tables. But I discovered this years back that the entire astrological premises on which people are doing these readings are wrong. Can you say wrong? That's what, they're wrong. Okay, so you don't have to sugarcoat it and dance around, make excuses about it. And if you've been into astrology, dude, you're in a good place right here. This could be home for you if you'd really look at this thing. What you've been trying to find out is God anyway, and you've been trying to find Him through the stars. Well, congratulations. Your, your quest is coming to an end here. You're going to find out some real things about the heavens here. So anyway, again, I'm saying this, and I'm sensitive. I, when I was writing my book on Christological astronomy, anyway, when I was doing this book, I... I I became aware that I was banging on astrologers pretty hard. And, and so I went back through and, and I recast the stuff in the book and I quit banging on astrologers and started banging on astrology. You know, again, because God doesn't hate the sinner, He hates the sin. You know, and He loves the sinner and wants to see the sinners converted. So the astrologers that you know, they're groping for answers right now and you have got them if you understand Christ, the astrologos, that is the answer to all these things. So, okay, coming back to what we were talking about in the Maseroth, and here is the picture of it again, uh, the Maseroth, all 12 of them. I want to take you on a lap around the ecliptic, and remember in our last session I shared with you the poem that summarizes each one of these constellations. Now, let me talk to you for a minute about constellations, all right? In the heavens, as God originally named the constellations, there were 48, say 48, 48 constellations. Now, there's been an astronomer's convention that's been uh, convened, um, and they then decided that they didn't have enough of them, so they've made 88 of them. So go figure, but anyhow, in the original 48 that God named, according to naming the stars, <clears throat> each one of the 12 major constellations have three minor constellations that are in it. It would be sort of like you have a book that's got 12 chapters, okay? And each chapter has got three subheadings. Got it? So that's how this works. And then actually... Each one of these 12 chapters is divided into three sections of four chapters. So Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius is a section. And then Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and Aries is a section. And then uh, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo is a section. But each one of these 12 has three subordinate or minor constellations underneath it. And all of these have star names in them that go back to antiquity. Actually, when Frances Rolleston began discovering the star names and their meanings, she found the most reliable source of star names was Arabic. And so, funny as it is, the first constellation that we're going to look at in the heavens uh, is Virgo. And Virgo is the promised seed. And the promised seed, the, the star names here tell us that it means the sun who comes. So these are the star names, for example, in Virgo. In the upper right-hand shoulder, you see Almerdurim. And Almerdurim means the sun who comes. The sun who comes. Now this comes out, this is, this is agreed in Chaldean, in Arabic, Hebrew, and other languages. This star name, regardless of the name of the language, it means the sun who comes. Funny, isn't it, that the first promise in the heavens is the sun who comes? And Islam says that God has 
no son. So guess what? I know that their God, Allah, is not the creator of the heavens. Because the very first constellation debunks Islam. Because there's a const And we got this star name out of the Arabic language. And it cannot be argued. The sun who comes. I like that. And there's other star names in here that gives the whole depiction of the promised seed. And this is the, the star that it is in the left hand of Virgo is the star named Al-Simach. And Al-Simach means the righteous branch. So we know that he is the son who comes and that he will be the righteous offspring of God. Hallelujah. And um, there's another star here, Zavi Yahweh, which is up here in the head of Virgo and this uh, and Zavi Yahweh means gloriously beautiful. Now there are other constellations that are that are this the subordinate constellations is Coma and Coma is the desire of the nations. It's a picture of a woman holding a child on her lap. The other one is Centaurus who shows that Christ would be born as the promised seed and uh, he would be the sin offering. Centaurus is the sin offering. Then the other constellation is Boots, B-O-O-T-E-S, or Botes, however you say it. And that means the one who is coming in judgment. Botes is the grim reaper. He <laughs> he. Anyhow, these pictures and all, and, and all this information is available. Let me show you something that I've got booted up here. Uh, this comes off of our website of our ministry and our ministry's website is www.lmci.org and this is in uh, in our e-store section in the PDF file uh, and this this is a free article that we have and this is E.W. Bullinger's appendix 12 out of his Bible and the name of this appendix is the stars also it has all this information about the star names. Here it is, um, as I've got it popped up here, um, Virgo. And then the next constellation is Libra. The one after that is Scorpio. But it's got the names of the subordinate constellations and the star names uh, in this appendix. And so I would highly recommend that you go to our website and download this and print it. And then you'll have all the star names that you need because I'm not going to go through and cover all of them today. I want to just give you the understanding that each one of these constellations is about Jesus. And these star names cannot, I'm telling you, cannot, they cannot be argued. And what we're dealing with here is an aspect of universal truth that transcends languages and culture. This is what people read every night. Now, these star names that dot and configure these constellations, and this comes out of our workbook, and this shows the major stars in Virgo, and it's, it's you know, you see the major stars here? Well, not all of these do we have the names to them, but <clears throat> this is, you know, like stick figures, and listen, it is not connect the dots, okay? Because you don't connect the dots and make a woman holding a shock of corn, right? or a shock of wheat, I mean. Uh, this is the figure that's drawn around these star names to help remember what the star names are communicating. So there's nothing um, about the figure. It, the figures can be drawn arbitrarily according to whoever wants to draw them. But this particular one has got all these dots right here. The reason I said this is, I had one of these guys come to me and said, what is this with all the dots here, he said. Does this connect the dots like you draw, connect all the dots and it makes a picture? He, I said, no. He said, I know. He said, because I could take any one of these and connect the dots and draw a 57 Chevy if I wanted to. <laughs> you know, but know that it's the star names that work. It's the star names that give the constellation its meaning. And so <clears throat> keep it right there because I want to show you Libra next, okay? And Libra is a set of scales. Here it is. And so these are the major stars in Libra, and you see them here. And then we also have in the workbook a means whereby you can identify the location of the stars, and here are the star names. Now this is in the workbook, and there's more details in E.W. Bullinger's uh, Companion Bible Appendix, and I've got a link that I will show you in just a moment about that. 
But let me show you on the PowerPoint slide here, Libra, which is the scales. And this is, the scales shows that there would be a price that would be paid. And the star names here, the one in the left side means, regardless of the Hebrew or the Arabic name, it means the price deficient. The star on the other side of the scale means the price sufficient. And then another star name means the price to be paid. So Libra is the scales. This shows that Christ was the promised seed and that His life would be the price that would be paid for redemption. That's what Libra shows. Next constellation is Scorpio. And Scorpio, if you look at Scorpio, it's got the foot of Ophiuchus on the heart of the scorpion. That, um, the star name where the foot is, is the, uh, is, the, is the star Antares that we talk about. And our Antares means the wounded one. And the other, con the other star name in Scorpio means the perverse. And Scorpio means the one who would be wounded. Who would be wounded. And Ophiuchus is the one who would be the wounder. But the next in the ecliptic path is Sagittarius. And Sagittarius, it looks like a centaur, half man and half horse, but the original pictures going all the way back into ancient Egypt and other zodiacs that's been found in antiquity is simply a fellow, a guy, riding a horse, shooting a bow. And this was the ultimate warrior. You know, the, the guy riding a horse, shooting a bow, he was unstoppable. And this is how the Lord is coming back and we see this depicted in Revelation 19 that he's coming back on a white horse. So this is him. So this is the Son of God coming back in glory. So when we read all this stuff about Sagittarius and Virgo and Libra, it's not, it's not, there's a mythological interpretation of the heavens that most people read today because of the names. And I'm sorry that the names are named after Greek or, or Egyptian gods. I didn't do it. But this is our touchstone of association. That's all I can do is use the names that I have. And, but Sagittarius shows the coming of the Lord again. So the, the first section in the book shows the Redeemer is coming. He's the promised seed, the price to be paid Libra, the wounded Scorpio. He's coming again someday. That's Sagittarius. Okay? So that's the first four constellations in the ecliptic, and then the next four <clears throat> is Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and Aries. And in, in these you'll see in Capricorn that he's the sacrificed redeemer that was raised on high in Aquarius to pour out his spirit on Jew and Gentile, Pisces, with promise to reign with him the ram on high. But look at Capricorn. Capricorn here is a half goat and a half fish. And you're thinking, well, now that looks like a perverse creature. Well, you know, yeah, it does, but it's got a message that we all need to see and understand that this is the first place in the heavens where the resurrection of Christ was actually foretold. That the goat would be the dying goat. This is representative of the scapegoat. Remember? In Old Testament times, they had the two goats, the live goat and the scapegoat. This was representative of the scapegoat that would die, that would die. And Christ died for you. You see, <clears throat> you know, talking about the, the Word of God in the heavens, the Bible talks about the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, and the blood of lamb. The blood of bull is Taurus, the blood of the goats Capricorn, and the blood of the lamb is Aries. And it was always in the heavens. It was in the heavens before Moses wrote it in the Old Testament. The Word of God in the heavens predates the written Scripture. So Moses got his learning from the heavens. The blood of the bull, the blood of the goat, and the blood of the lamb. That's Taurus, Capricorn, and Aries. Hallelujah. So, you know, this is just sort of like peeling layers of, of ignorance off of our eyeballs so that we can see that these things have actually been in the Scriptures for low so many years. Praise God. Anyhow, but this is the dying goat. You can see the goat sort of dying and falling. And then you see the, the hind part of this figure is like the tail of a fish. <clears throat> and sure enough, that means a living fish. So this shows a dying goat and a living fish. This is the representation of Christ being crucified and Christ being raised. Huh. 
I'll show you when we get to the Christ's birth sky that Mars was in this constellation when Christ was born, showing that he had the fervor and zeal to fight to be raised from the dead. That's my guy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyhow, after Capricorn is Aquarius, and here we have the picture of the guy with the water urn coming out of his belly. Remember I said I'd show you this from John 7, 38. Jesus said, as the scripture hath said, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So look at me here. I want to stretch your brain here for a second. Jesus called this scripture. Let me say it again. Jesus called this scripture. Did you get it? Did you get it yet? Yeah. This is the Word of God. Well, I didn't know it. Well, that's why you're here. It's to learn it. Praise God. But God never leaves Himself without a witness. And He's got the witness of His Word in the heavens. You never had a Bible. You can still know who the Messiah is. But anyway, here's the water being poured out of the urn. And this shows the giving of the Holy Spirit Christologically, that Christ would be the one who would give His life and then would be the one who would uh, pour out the Holy Spirit. So that's Aquarius. Pisces is the, is the two fishes joined by a, a band. The one fish that's going up toward the, the center of the heavens to the north, it represents Israel. And the one that's flowing horizontal along the band of the ecliptic represents the Gentiles, and the band is Christ. He is the one that joined the two together. Both Jew and Gentiles, Ephesians chapter 3, fellow heirs of the same body, right? And, and the Gentiles would be partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. I thank God for Jesus Christ annexing the Gentiles into the kingdom. Because I'm not a Jew. I'm a just a born-again Gentile. Hallelujah. Amen. That's who, I, that's who I am. I don't need a lineage, a bloodline that takes me back to Abraham. All I need is a belief that takes me back to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm really not intimidated by not being a Jew. That's fine with me. Christ redeemed the Gentiles as well. But this is the truth that's in Pisces. I'm sure there's some born-again Gentiles around here that's very thankful for that too. Amen. Amen. For sure. <laughs> And next after Pisces is Aries. And Aries is the ram that reigns after he was slain. And so uh, this is the ram of God. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, it was plastered right in the heavens is Aries. Praise God. It begins to make sense now. These guys had a much deeper working knowledge of these things than we do. Let me tell you what happened. You know, Satan tried to hide all these things, but when the Roman Catholics took control over the church, they muddied the water in a lot of different ways. And, and, and what they did was through syncretism, they founded a new religion that kept some names of Christianity, but they were still representative of deities in false religions in Babylon mystery religion. So a lot of the things that, that were known in the first century are not known now because we've, they've been run through the Roman Catholic filter. And... Uh, but bless God, we know them because the Bible left these hints and these details for us to, to know and understand. Anyway, so then that, that section of Capricorn through Aries, Capricorn is the sacrificed redeemer raised on high. Then in Aquarius, he, he poured out his spirit, Pisces, on Jew and Gentile, and Aries with promise to reign with the ram from on high. So that's the middle section, and it deals with the redemption or the price that would be paid for redemption. 